In August of 1995, the North Korean government did the unthinkable. It admitted to the rest of the world that it was suffering from food shortages, and it requested international assistance. The regime blamed the food shortages on floods that occurred back in July, wiping out fields and storehouses. There certainly were floods, but the famine had begun long before that. And like most famines in modern history, this one was man-made. The origins of this famine go back to World War II and the division of Korea between the Soviet-aligned Communist North and the American-aligned Anti-Communist South. The northern end of the peninsula had most of the country's factories as well as its coal and iron mines, while the south had most of the arable farmland. This gave North Korea an advantage when it came to industrial production, but a disadvantage when it came to agriculture. Because there was less arable land in general, this made farm collectivization less difficult. But, like most famines in communist countries, the collective farms were the root of the problem. When the North began its collectivization efforts, they had two role models to follow, the Soviet Union and China. When the USSR and China collectivized their farms, they still allowed households to have some land for their own personal usage, while the produce of the collective land was taken by the state. These collective farms had a reputation of being less efficient than the non-collectivized ones. In North Korea, the central planners believed this inefficiency was caused by farm workers choosing to put more effort into their private plots than the collective farm. In order to counter this, they gave individual families little to no farmland for private use, making sure the amount was too small to be worth putting effort into. This way, the planners believed, they would have no choice but to put all of their effort into the collective farms. But this would not make the collective farms more efficient. Many families would sneak into the mountains, which were ill-suited for large-scale farming, and find small spots where they could plant a modest garden for their own personal use and profit. Despite their poor farming sector, North Korea was able to grow its economy by focusing on manufacturing, outproducing the South for the first couple of decades of independence. However, they were only able to do this by underpaying their workers compared to other communist countries, as well as becoming dependent on investment from other communist countries. In the 1960s, Kim Il-sung pushed for greater self-reliance as part of its Juche ideology, by using science and industry to increase agricultural output. A big part of this was the adoption of the Chongsun Ri system in 1964. This new system called for increasing the use of mechanization in the form of trucks and tractors, increasing chemicalization in the form of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, along with increased irrigation and electrification. On top of this, Kim Il-sung also ordered that crops be planted on mountains, which would subsequently be made more efficient through the use of chemicals. North Korea would see about 20 years of increased agricultural output, but these methods would be what made the floods of 1995 so devastating. Now all these things are used and are important in modern agriculture but the North Koreans would become too dependent on fertilizers. Overusing chemicals can weaken the soil, resulting in erosion, and this is what happened in North Korea. Nutrients in the soil were depleted and never restored. When the seasonal rains came, the weakened soil would be carried off by the waters from the fields and be deposited into the bottoms of rivers, causing the level of the riverbed to rise, and thus lowering their carrying capacity. When the rains came in the summer of 1995, the rivers couldn't absorb the excess water, which resulted in worse flooding. This over-reliance on chemicals was a product of the Juche ideology, which emphasizes self-reliance, especially in things like food production. Juche didn't just emphasize material self-reliance, but also intellectual self-reliance. The regime rejected common farming practices such as crop rotation, letting land lay fallow, or even double planting, because these were foreign ideas despite the fact that European farmers had been doing most of these since the Middle Ages. And this experience isn't unique to North Korea. There was a period of several decades in the Soviet Union where Soviet scientists and agronomists were forced to reject Mendelian genetics because the science was seen as philosophically supporting capitalism. Now, this is a story for another time, but it's another prominent example of how political ideology can corrupt science. Now, the corrupted science and agricultural policies were bad enough, but these problems would be exacerbated by an economic slowdown in the 1970s. Kim Il-sung's regime would try to reverse their economic fortunes by selectively breaking with Juche, which should be understood more as an evolving list of justifications for anything the regime was doing, rather than a stringent ideology or school of thought. Most of North Korea's industry had been focused on producing capital goods, stuff that is used to make other stuff but not much in the way of stuff that was to be used on its own. They especially lagged behind when it came to communications technology, which the South would come to excel at. 
To remedy this lag, the regime tried to buy entire factories from overseas. They bought and imported an entire petrochemical plant in 1971, along with a concrete factory in 1973 from France. And in 1977, they tried to buy a steel mill from Japan, but the sale was denied. Around this time period, we see North Korea begin a wave of kidnappings, forcing foreign experts to come and work. And it wasn't just engineers. Kim Jong-il would have actors and directors from Japan and South Korea kidnapped in order to help him produce propaganda films. I would suggest watching this video from the Atrocity Guide if you're more interested in that last story. North Korea is a heavily regimented society with an intrusive surveillance state. I don't know how much good it will do you there, but there's a reason people in countries like China, Russia, and Iran use products from Nord, who is sponsoring this video. Not too long ago, my channel was hacked by a bunch of crypto scammers spewing out a bunch of old live streams of Elon Musk. Those were five of the most stressful days of my recent memory, and as I awaited the return of my channel, I was determined to up my cybersecurity. And this video sponsor, NordPass, can help you with that. Something far too many people do is reuse the same passwords for so many websites. And the reason for this is because human memory is limited. Coming up with a unique password of letters, numbers, and special characters is just really difficult to find one that can't just be guessed by a human being. Well, NordPass is a solution to a bunch of these problems. It can store all of your passwords in one place. It can generate far better passwords than you can think of yourself, and it can autofill them so that way you don't have to remember them for which websites you're using which passwords for. NordPass can also help you shop and browse faster online by securely storing your credit card and personal details. It also has a data breach scanner warning you if one of your online accounts or your credit card information has been leaked. It can also tell you how many of your current passwords are repeated, weak, or just too old. Cybersecurity has become extremely important to me, and if it's something that's important to you as well, then NordPass can help, and viewers of this channel can get a special deal. Get exclusive access to NordPass's best offer here at nordpass.com slash casualhistorian, or use the code casualhistorian at checkout to get an additional month for free. Thanks so much to NordPass for sponsoring this video, but for now, let's get back to the history. Unfortunately for North Korea, it wasn't able to import its way into a more advanced economy, and the purchases it made put the government nearly $3 billion into debt. The regime needed foreign aid to remain afloat. But I feel like I should explain exactly what I mean by foreign aid or even subsidies. If you read about the famine, you'll see these terms thrown around to describe how the Soviet Union and Communist China were propping up Kim Il-sung, but the mechanism by which they did is quite foreshadowing of their future problems. Now, one of the reasons North Korea has had trouble getting a hold of cash and why subsequently they've become infamous for their counterfeiting operations is because North Korea manufactures low quality goods that nobody wants. Now, the Soviet economy was pretty isolated from the rest of the world compared to the United States, but they still had goods the rest of the world wanted, such as oil, vodka, and cheap weapons. But North Korea had nothing the rest of the world wanted. This is where the foreign aid or subsidies come into the picture. The Soviets and Chinese agreed to trade their higher valued oil or machine parts for much less valuable North Korean products, such as canned sardines. And despite these subsidies and foreign aid, North Korea's economy continued to decline. They became more and more dependent on Soviet energy sources to run their factories that produced the fertilizers. By the mid-1980s, North Korean agriculture began to sharply decline in tandem with its reduction in chemical production, which meant less access to the fertilizers their farms had become dependent on. As in other socialist command economies throughout the world, the lack of market incentives in North Korea had likely begun to hinder the economy by the early 1980s, if not before. By the early 1990s, there was a clear evidence of a severe economic decline, one that occurred well before the summer floods of 1995 that formally precipitated the famine. Food rationing had begun in the early 1980s and only became more severe as food production shrank. And despite North Korea being a communist country that allegedly abolishes class, North Korea very much has a class system based on how much the state values your labor and how loyal they perceive you and your family to be. The highest ranked, obviously, were members of the Communist Party, those who held positions in government and the military. Beneath them were those who worked in heavy industries, followed by service workers, and at the bottom were farmers. 
Intersecting those layers were the families of those who fought the Japanese, followed by those who had remained neutral in the fight, with the families of those who collaborated with the Japanese, along with the families of people who had defected to the South, being at the bottom. This loyalty class system was very important because it often restricted what kinds of jobs you could get and what food rations you were allotted by the state. Urban workers were entirely dependent on the state to provide food, while rural workers were mostly cut off from the state-run system of food distribution. This was because the rurals, who usually worked on the collective farms, were given a portion of their own crops to live on. But unlike urban families who received rations on a weekly, fortnightly, or monthly basis, rural families were given their rations on an annual basis and would have to make it last the entire year. This is why rural families would go into the mountains to plant and maintain secret gardens. It was the only way to sustain you and your family because the state allotted rural families fewer rations per person than urban ones. The regime overvalued industrial workers who produced goods nobody outside North Korea wanted, while undervaluing farmers that produced goods literally everyone needed. The food situation was already precarious, but the fall of the Soviet Union, along with China's transition to a market economy, would send North Korea hurtling toward famine. By 1991, North Korea was receiving only 10% of the Russian goods that it had in 1990, going from 1.97 billion to 0.58 billion. China stepped up to fill the gap, but only partially, going from 0.39 billion in 1990 to 0.58 billion in 1991 and 0.66 billion in 1993, but then declining to 0.47 billion in 1994. One of North Korea's top exports, small arms, also declined from 423 million between 1987 and 1990 to only 160 million between 1991 and 1994, down to only 80 million between 1995 and 1997. Prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, North Korea had a 12% shortfall in food production to feed its own population. This shortfall would be immediately felt as the Soviet Union dissolved. In response to this, a let's only eat two meals a day campaign was launched in 1991. 1993 would see reports of food shortages, and in 1994 radio broadcasts in North Korea admitted there was hunger in the country. In order to increase the allotted rations for urban workers, the government reduced the amount given to rural workers from 167 kilograms a year to 107. This was a reduction from 457 grams per day to 293. This resulted in farming families trying to hide produce from the government collectors, which further exacerbated the famine. Refugees began pouring across the border into China in 1994, where journalists reported that rations in North Korea had dropped to just 150 grams of food a day. Floods in the summer of 1995 damaged 400,000 hectares of arable land and displaced half a million people, which reduced grain production by two tons, nearly a third of the 6.5 million tons needed to feed the country, which they were already failing to do. The floods were especially bad in the northern provinces, and more flooding would happen in 1996 and 1997. Those that suffered the most were farmers in regions hit by the floods, who no longer had any grain to hide from the government, as well as those who didn't have connections to higher-ups, such as miners, factory workers, and transport workers. Among those refugees affected by the floods and famine, their allotment was 30 grams per day as late as 1997. They would have to supplement their diets with food purchased on the gray and black markets, as well as foraging in the wild, combing through trash cans, and stealing. The World Food Program would become increasingly involved in relieving the famine, delivering 5,000 tons of food in 1995 and 387,000 tons in 1998. By 1998, about half of the World Food Program's resources were being spent in North Korea, with the United States becoming the largest bilateral donor. However, governments around the world were hesitant to send too much aid for fear of the North Korean regime appropriating the food and selling it on the black market. There were reports of North Korean officials diverting the food to the open markets to sell for a profit rather than distribute it to the hungry. Much of the food was also rerouted to the military. It is estimated that only about 10% of the food sent in actually went to alleviating famine victims, with another 10% going to the military and the remaining 80% going to enrich government officials. Between 1994 and 2000, between 1 and 3 million North Koreans would die from famine and illnesses caused or exacerbated by malnutrition. And although conditions have been alleviated somewhat since then, it was a traumatic event for those living through it. As horrible as this famine was, it just may have planted the seed for the regime's future destruction.
Despite all the foreign aid coming in, it took years for famine conditions to subside. An authoritarian regime's legitimacy is based on its ability to provide what it promises. And for communist regimes, that's material security. If you can't provide the most basic of these necessities, food, you are proven illegitimate. Since the North Korean government couldn't fulfill this basic promise, they, in secret, began to loosen their controls on the economy. Entrepreneurial North Koreans would sneak across the border into China, buy food, medicine, or some other valued good, and sell it on the black market in North Korea. Smugglers were able to provide the relief that the state was incapable of doing, but it wouldn't be too long before the state began to take a cut of these operations themselves. When one of these entrepreneurs would be caught crossing the border into or out of China, North Korean officials would demand a bribe to keep silent about the incident, allowing the smuggler to continue on their way. Corruption became a necessary part of the business, considering private enterprise was, and to this day still is, illegal. In the 90s and early 2000s, this trade was mostly providing necessities that were in short supply. But as the famine began to recede into memory, the secret economy continued to grow, now importing luxury items. They would begin to import things such as radios, DVD players, and personal computers. They imported films and TV shows from abroad, especially from South Korea. This began to expose the North Korean population to the living conditions in South Korea, which they were always told was an economic backwater and little more than an American colony. This is the most embarrassing thing for the North Korean regime. It's one thing to be weaker than America or China, but to be weaker than South Korea, who are essentially the same people but under a different political and economic system, is humiliating. The last two decades have seen people in North Korea become very wealthy engaging in the black market, but these people have become targets of the regime. If some official in the government becomes jealous of one of these entrepreneurs, it's not too difficult to have that person arrested and for that government official to simply take over their business. However, the regime can only crack down on them so much. After the famine, the people of North Korea have less respect for the regime, and it's not uncommon to see civilians arguing with security personnel in public, something previous generations would have never contemplated. It's too early to tell whether these acts of resistance can destabilize the regime enough to topple it, but if change is ever to come to North Korea, it is a necessary component of it. Thanks again to NordPass for sponsoring this video. If you are interested in improving your cybersecurity like myself, then go ahead and check out nordpass.com slash casual historian to get a special deal or use the code casual historian at checkout to get an additional month for free. I'd also like to thank my patrons for supporting this channel. Their support allows me to spend more time working on videos and less time working a normal day job. If you want to become a patron as well and get the numerous perks that are available, check out patreon.com slash casual historian to learn more. Now, if topics about economics in East Asia is something that interests you, then might I suggest checking out this previous video about the economic miracle that happened in Japan after World War II. Or you could also watch my video about the creation of Israel's secret nuclear program. YouTube decided to age restrict and demonetize that video after a week and the views have just flatlined. So if you want to go ahead and watch that video, if you haven't already seen it, I would really appreciate it. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.